Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm Andy Linehan, president of the City Club. Welcome back to City Club after what I hope has been a relaxing and peaceful summer for all of you. What better way to start our fall series on keeping Oregon's promise than to have Jack McGowan, director of Solve, with us here today. Jack's presentation today begins a series that will continue on the first Friday of each month from now through February. The Keeping Oregon's Promise series uh, was prompted by the sense of crisis and dismay that have seemed to have dominated Oregon for the last few years. Are we losing a shared purpose or sense of shared purpose that links city and rural dwellers, R's and D's, upstate and downstate? What's become of the reputation for optimistic innovation that once characterized Oregon in the eyes of many, much of the rest of America. Is the current generation of leaders and citizens keeping Oregon's promise? Our series on keeping Oregon's promise will bring us Oregon leaders from all sectors to provide their insights on the topics of leadership, economic development, community building, and the provision of public services. After Jack McGowan's uh, introduction today, uh, in subsequent uh, forums, Ethan Seltzer, director of PSU's Institute of Portland Metropolitan Studies, will moderate each subsequent panel. As a taste of what's to come in the series, our October panel will feature Chris Coleman of Portland Center Stage, Gunn Denhardt of Hannah Anderson, and David Yaden, former director of the Oregon Department of Energy, and they'll have a conversation about leadership in Oregon. Before we begin our uh, program today, though, I have several items of City Club business. We've stored up a number of them over the summer, so please bear with me for a few minutes. Uh, during the Keeping Oregon's Promise series, that kicks off today, the usual $25 new member sign-up fee will be waived. Uh, this is, offer is good only during the series forum. So if you've been thinking of joining City Club, you can join today without paying that sign-up fee. There's, a mem there's membership material at the back table over there. And for more information, see any of the City Club staff or myself afterwards. Uh, next Friday, September 12th, please join us to hear author Eleanor Langer speak on her newest book, A Hundred Little Hitlers, The Death of a Black Man, The Trial of a White Racist, and the Rise of the Neo-Nazi Movement in America. As you may know, the heart of this book is the murder of Mulligata Sorrell on the streets of Portland in 1988. Eleanor Langer's very well-received book, examines the development of the neo-Nazi racist movement in America and the connections to Portland. The Portland City Club has become a community partner to the World Affairs Council of Oregon. During the Council's 2003-2004 International Speaker Series, 20% of the ticket purchases will be donated to the City Club. So, if you mention you heard about the, uh, if you, that is, if you heard about the series through the City Club, uh, the first forum is Thursday, October 16th, and will feature former Israeli Prime Minister Shimon Peres and Palestinian Foreign Affairs Minister Nabil Shaf. Uh, for more information, uh, there's uh, information on the back table, and this would be a great uh, thing to do to uh, help both City Club and the World Affairs Council. The World Affairs, uh, excuse me, the City Club's annual fund drive kicks off today. Your donations are absolutely essential to allowing City Club to continue to provide high quality programming and research. Financial support will also help us increase the club's visibility and its influence through the new initiatives and programs that you'll begin to see happening this year. You're gonna be seeing some changes over the course of the year and I think you'll agree that they're very positive and it takes your support to allow those to happen. The goal for this year's annual fund drive is $115,000. Uh, contributions can be made by credit card or paid as an automatic withdrawal from your monthly, uh, monthly withdrawal from your account. Uh, we have contribution em envelopes at the back table and you should be aware that this year, for the first time, donations are also eligible for both tax credits and tax deductions when you donate to the Oregon Cultural Trust. Uh, we got uh, the City Club listed as a participating organization in the Oregon Cultural Trust, and you can get a credit, not a, not a tax deduction, but a credit if you give to City Club plus the uh, Cultural Trust. For more information about how that works, you can go to www.culturaltrust.org or see any of the City Club staff, and they can tell you that, about the mechanics of it. I would like to recognize today a very sad event, the passing of John Storrs. John Storrs was a distinguished Oregon architect. He was a longtime City Club member, and he was the husband of former uh, City Club president, Fran Storrs. This is a very sad moment for all of us. We wanna share our, our, our uh, sorrow with, with Fran and, and her family. Today with us, we have uh, three new members, I believe. 
And I would ask them to stand if they could. Ruth Shepherd, remember? There, welcome. Welcome, Ruth. Uh, Aaron Tersteg, I think is new. Welcome. And Dr. Thomas Manley. Dr. Thomas Manley here. Great. Welcome to City Club. Um, I would also like to uh, welcome uh, elected officials and community leaders who are here. Um, let's see, at least we had registered, and I'm not sure if they've uh, showed up yet, but we had uh, Mayor Charles Becker uh, from Gresham, um, the city, man city manager of Gresham, Rob Fussell, let's see, Multnomah uh, County Commissioner Maria Rojo de Steffi, and uh, Multnomah C County Commissioner Serena Cruz, and finally Representative Billy Dalto. Ah, welcome. Thanks for coming today. <laughs> Finally, let me note that broadcast of City Club programs this quarter is made possible in part by corporate underwriting from Washington Mutual and Portland General Electric. We're very grateful for their support. Let's turn to the program. I could introduce Jack McGowan as the man who has inspired me and thousands of other Oregon Oregonians each year to grub in the dirt looking for stashes of discarded tire, tires and dripping bags of used diapers. But his role is much more than that. As uh, his role through Solve is, is, uh, has been as organizer of some of the country's largest volunteer cleanup events. But that's only one of the ways that Jack has used his energy, enthusiasm, and organizational genius to benefit Oregon. Solve is a uniquely Oregonian organization that brings together government agencies, businesses, and individual volunteers in programs and projects to enhance the livability of Oregon. For the last 13 years, Jack McGowan has been executive director of SOLVE and helped it expand from 5,000 volunteers to nearly 90,000 volunteers. SOLVE annually brings together, or brings us the largest uh, uh, beach cleanup events in the nation, as well as other programs that restore our environment, support community development, teach environmental stewardship, and recognize community leadership. Truly SOLVE is one of the treasures of Oregon and SOLVE volunteers keep Oregon's promise in all their SOLVE activities. But Jack McGowan has served our community in, in many ways. Uh, his career began on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange and has taken him through stints as television reporter, aide to Mayor Bud Clark, and public direct relations director for the zoo among other roles. At SOLVE and in many other ways, Jack McGowan has become one of our most visible and successful role models as citizen and leader. Please welcome Jack McGowan. Thank you, everyone. Folks, I think I better quit while I'm ahead, from, because uh, from here on in, it's all downhill. I want to thank you, uh, really on behalf of not only uh, the organization that I represent, Solve, but, but on behalf of the rest of Oregon. The City Club of Portland is a very valuable resource. I want to talk a tiny bit about that, but more really about what Oregon is about. I also want to thank Oregon Public Radio for broadcasting uh, today's address to the rest of the, of the state and also uh, to Portland Cable Access for carrying it live and, and also subsequent rebroadcasts. My remarks, hopefully, are going to ring true to all Oregonians who hear it. As your president, Andy Linehan, stated, the goal of these presentations will be to stimulate community dialogue, help define common ground, and be a catalyst for action. When I say community, I'm not talking about the Portland metropolitan area. I'm talking about all of Oregon. Everyone who hears us today and in the coming months will have a place at the table. For it is all of Oregon that is challenged. No community, no person is immune. Again, I want to thank you all for inviting me today, but for the life of me, I don't know why you invited me. I'm not an economist. So I can't offer you a crystal ball on where our economy is headed. I'm not a biologist or a scientist, so I can't give you a report on the state of the environment in Oregon. My only credentials are that I truly love this state and that for the past 13 years, my wife Jan and I have had the honor of leading an organization whose mission and service most closely reflects how we feel about our beloved Oregon. So this talk today is really from one Oregonian to another others who I believe care as strongly and deeply about this state as I do. Permit me to start our conversation with a quote. Now, many of you have heard this before, so I hope it doesn't bore anyone. 
But in thinking about where we, Oregon, are today and the theme of the series that the City Club was sponsoring, I could not think of a more apropos statement. So here it is. I have seen a lot of scenery in my life, but I have seen nothing so tempting as a home for man or woman as this Oregon country. You have here a basis for civilization on its highest scale. But I'm going to ask you a question which you may not like. Are you good enough to have this country in your possession? Have you got enough intelligence, imagination, and cooperation among you to make the best of these opportunities? That quote was given in a speech to you, the City Club of Portland, by the noted historian and planner, Lewis Mumford, in July of 1938. So what's the answer we can give that question today? Do we have enough intelligence, imagination, cooperation among us? Or do we take Oregon all too much for granted? First, intelligence. Even though education in this state is mightily challenged, I still hear that for now, our SAT scores and are some of the highest in the nation, and that our universities can still hold their own. I stress for now. That's another conversation for another time with an expert on those matters. But is that intelligence really what Mumford meant when he challenged us? Or was it the intelligence to realize what we have and not to take it for granted, but to cherish it, nurture it, build upon it for future generations? Second, imagination. Now we're getting closer to the subject at hand. Oregon was known for its collective imagination, which gave us the beach bill, the bottle bill, land use planning, it was even reflected in our state motto, she flies with her own wings. Translated, we marched to the tune of a different drummer. We patted ourselves on the back for those creative and significant achievements. We pounded our chests, and we collectively said, look what we're known for. But we forgot to say that all of these stars in our crown were over 30 years old. What are we known for today? Highest unemployment, most hunger, Shortest school year, Tanya Harding? Is that what it's all about? I don't think so. It isn't, and it doesn't have to be, because I believe we still have the imagination, the cooperation, the intelligence to make Oregon better. What was Lewis Mumford's third challenge? Cooperation, cooperation. And that's where I believe these challenges all stem from. Our successes and our failures all stem from whether we embrace or turn our backs on this one simple concept, cooperation. Call it respect, call it trust, call it common vision. It's really all about cooperation, about getting along and keeping the common good in front of us. You've now heard once again Lewis Mumford's famous quote, and now I'd like to pose three more questions to you, and they're not hard. Folks, it's show of hands time. Are you all ready? For our listening audience, I'm translating the visual response to a non-scientific verbal report to you. <laughs> First question, how many of you are native-born Oregonians? Raise your hands. I'd say about maybe a third of the room. Second question, and be honest, how many of us were born elsewhere? Raise your hand. Third question. How many of all of us are so doggone happy to live here? Raise your hand. <laughs> That's the thread. That's the theme. That's what binds us. Why can't that be the first building block for building the new Oregon? I said before many times, now you gotta listen close. I've said before many times that the or only Oregonians who were taken kicking and screaming into Oregon were the ones that were born here. <laughs> it's subtle. The rest of us, whether they be Kennewick man, the first tribes, those who reached their final destination on the Oregon Trail, or those today in Ontario, in Lakeview, in Bandon, in Baker City, in Oregon City, who are just unpacking the U-Haul trailer, were and still are looking for Eden's Gate, Oregon. Permit me, if you will, to give you a brief history of Solve 
because I think it's a shining example that fulfills Mumford's vision of cooperation. Backtrack, rewind the time machine, 1969. Governor Tom McCall, Glenn Jackson, Edith Green, John Passantini, Grattan Cairns, Ted Halleck, remarkable men and women, Republicans and Democrats, collectively coming under the mantle of the governor's vision of building an organization that was going to be the preeminent catalyst for building a cooperation between government, local, regional, state, and federal government agencies, business from the Nikes of the world to the corner barber shop in Lakeview, and most importantly, us, the citizens of Oregon. Business, government, citizens. The catalyst was solved to link the three in volunteer efforts to preserve the livability of Oregon, but also preserve the community of Oregon, the essence of Oregon, why we call Oregon our home. McCall did something else to Oregon in this creation of Solve that was one of the biggest gifts that he could give the state, and that is he stridently refused, demanded, forbid the organization from ever taking a stand on any issue that could polarize one element of Oregon society against another. Senate bill, House bill, initiative, referendum, candidate for public office, spotted owl, land use planning, timber exports, whatever it may be, we at Salv might have our own personal feelings, but we cannot manifest those feelings into a public dialogue. Our job is to build bridges, not fences. Now today we have between 80 and 90,000 volunteers in over 250 communities in Oregon making Solve the largest volunteer nonprofit in the Pacific Northwest. Not in staff, not in budget, but in the two areas that I think are most important. People who are engaged and the number of communities served. And folks, it all comes down to us paying less attention to what divides us and more attention to what unites us, which is basically a shared love for this treasure that we call Oregon. In my estimation, we need to pay more attention to the big table and include everyone in the big tent. We need to talk more with each other about things that matter and take action, not just complain. Our statewide elected officials can't do it all. As you can see from this past session, they were carrying a huge weight. And it's our responsibility to communicate with each other. And I have some specific ideas that I can share with you at the conclusion of my remarks, if you'd like. Since moving to Oregon 34 years ago, my work and play have carried me and my family all over this remarkable state. We've taken the road less traveled through Silver Lake, Junchura, Fields, Monument, Kimberly, Ukiah, Plush, Prairie City. We've had wonderful times speaking with Minnie Tucker in LaGrande, Lita Hunter in Bly, Jack Wilson in North Powder, and Bill. Jan and I will never forget Bill. A wizened old cowboy, now retired, who drives 50 miles from his home in Prineville each day to spend time doing what he knows and loves best, namely getting on his horse to ride into his beloved Williams Prairie, nestled in the middle of the Ochico Mountains. In speaking with these and many other folks from large cities and small towns across all of Oregon, I no longer come away with the impression that they're frustrated with how a majority of the economic prosperity went to the mid and upper Willamette Valley in the mid-19 and late 1990s or that they feel that they have been forgotten by Oregon's headlong rush into the 21st century. Instead, these views I once heard have been replaced by a quiet sadness that something fundamentally has changed in this beloved state, and it's not for the better. This change manifests each day in the way our politics have become battlegrounds not for the common good, remember cooperation, remember respect, or visionary inclusive thought and action, but for limited personal views. Listen, if you can, to talk radio. Does it respect divergent views? Does it stimulate thoughtful dialogue with positive circumstances and outcomes? In my personal view, no. It's me against you, us against them. Don't trust their kind. You know what they're like. Ridicule, demean, shout down, interrupt, all for the cherished rating points and monetary profit and the hell with who is hurt or what is damaged. Talk about lack of.
talk about lack of vision. Any one of us in this room or those listening could make money right now by finding an audience and sowing the seeds of mistrust, division, and criticism. It's so easy to build fences, to tear down at the all too delicate fabric of society, as opposed to building bridges. Today, division even shows in the way our morning commute unfolds on Highway 26, I-84, I-5, or many other roads around the state. The simple courtesy of letting someone merge in front of you, as opposed to saving two seconds by speeding up, says an awful lot about how we now feel about each other. But how much nobler to go through life being respectful and careful of our fellow Oregonians and this good land. My friends, the opposite of vision is division. And I feel more and more that we are marching to the tune of the latter. Nature abhors a vacuum, and unfortunately for the time being, that is what has filled it, and look at where we are as a result. But I believe that there is a hunger that is felt by a majority of Oregonians, I among them. We're looking for something, a thread, that can set a tone of unity and vision. The equation isn't profound or even difficult. Oregon, take a deep collective breath. Put the ear to the wall of your heart and listen. Look around you at the land and at one another. That is the wealth we share in the shared thread that still binds us. Imagine what we could do with that thread. That thread is community. But community doesn't just happen. For those who remember Tom McCall, many are still waiting for the next reincarnation, and we can't afford to wait. It is up to us to create that dynamic once, once again. Oregon has changed, and we can't go back, but we can collectively create a new, a better, a dynamic Oregon. Remember those solve events that I just relayed to you a short while ago? Take, take the beach cleanups, for example. This fall will mark the 20th anniversary of this worldwide Oregon statement, started right here in Oregon 20 years ago. It is now spread to over 100 foreign countries. Normally, if the weather's nice, we'll get around 6,000 volunteers. No one gets paid. Parents wake sleepy children up that early Saturday morning, and they drive 50, 100, 150 miles to reclaim an essence of Oregon. Four hours later, the entire coastline of our beloved state is spotlessly clean, right down to the last cigarette butt. What a remarkable statement about what it means to live in Oregon. It's like the rock hitting the pond. The initial splash is 6,000 people. The beaches are clean. But look deeper. The ripples that emanate from that splash are profound. Community, even for a brief period, was formed. It's not just 6,000 people. It's 6,000 Republicans and Democrats and liberals and conservatives. 6,000 gays and lesbians and fundamentalist Christians and Muslims and atheists. 6,000 timber workers and environmentalists. 6,000 CEOs and mailroom clerks. 6,000 urban and rural residents. 6,000 of them. 6,000 of those. 6,000 of us. As I said, the idea of community doesn't just happen. I believe that there are seven steps to building community, and at Solve, we feel that all of our activities incorporate these steps. The first step that I feel that brings community together is association. When people get together for a shared activity like a beach cleanup or other volunteer activity, what do they do? They associate with one another. And from association comes familiarity. As they work together, they become familiar with one another. In many instances, this might be the first time that they interact with them. And from familiarity comes dialogue. And as we work together, we converse. You know, I didn't know you felt that way. That's the same way I feel. And areas of shared concern begin to emerge. And from dialogue to trust, working side by side and watching out for, another, for each other, we learn to trust one another. And from trust to consensus, we find things we actually agree upon. I didn't know you felt that way. I never thought your kind ever felt maybe something the way my kind felt. Imagine that. I listen to your side of the an issue, and it's not as odd as I thought. Maybe I can move my position a little bit because I trust you. And from consensus to vision, 
Together we can create shared ideas on where we should go and how to get there. What's really important emerges and a lot of the elements of division are left behind. And finally, from vision to action. Action, we should do it. Action, we can do it. Action, let's do it. Years ago, during one of my first Solve events, I want to leave you, I want to just tell you a quick story. Solve does this huge Earth Day cleanup called Solve It every year. It's the largest Earth Day cleanup in the United States. Thousands and thousands of volunteers. We've cleaned up over 12 million pounds of illegally dumped foreign debris out of wetlands and stream beds. We've had to count every single tire. This is in the Tri-County area, folks. We've had to count every single tire. And just in tires alone, we topped out this year on the total amount collected at over 37,500 tires out of wetlands and stream beds. We were cleaning up a horrific illegal dump site in western Washington County, Jackson Creek, beautiful area near North Plains, C tumbling out of the West Hills, going finally into the Jackson uh, Bottom Wetlands. Jackson Creek at one point of this area was spotlessly clean. Jackson Creek had to go through thousands of pounds of mattresses, tires, box springs, credenzas, motor oil, pesticide containers, bags of garbage, car bodies, and finally, on the other end, Jackson Creek emerged, I would say somewhat worse for wear. So we had hundreds of volunteers there. Portland General Electric brought in knuckle boom trucks. And we had hundreds of volunteers working collectively together. And I'm in the middle of coordinating this, and all of a sudden, this man walks up to me, huge bear of a man. And I judge from his clothes that he's probably a retired logger or farmer, maybe about 80 years of age. And he comes up and he says to me, uh, what are you doing? And I said, well, we're, we're cleaning up this illegal dump site. Look over the bank, and you can't believe it. I said, this water is people's drinking water further on down. This is their groundwater. This is affecting their wells. And he said, but none of you live around here. And I said, well, it, it, it doesn't matter. We're all working on this together. We're all Oregonians. And he looked a little bit further, and he said, you know what, though? None of you live around here. And I said, well, it doesn't matter. We're, 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 we're doing this because we care. And I got busy with coordinating the event with all of these hundreds of volunteers. And I looked, and he walked away. And I thought to myself, son of a gun, you can't win them all. Sometimes it just doesn't work. So I got busy. 20 minutes later, I looked down this little old country road, gravel road, and here's this man in his old, probably 1940, 1950 farm all tractor, pulling out a former manure spreader, which years ago had made into a flatbed. And for the next three years, this man, who didn't know anyone, worked collectively together with people he had never met before. And three hours later, all of the illegal dumping was cleaned. The drop boxes, one after the other, were all cleaned. All the, the cars were winched out. And people were celebrating. We were filthy, we were tired, but my God, we did it. And he came up to me, and he had tears in his eyes, and he put his arm around me, and he said, you know what? I haven't seen this since the 1930s, when my dad used to take me to barn raisings. And folks, that's what it's about. We're raising the barns of community. It's raising the barns of cooperation, of trust, of mutual respect of non-polarization, of shared vision. That's what it's about. I told you that today, Solve engages between 80 and 90,000 volunteers across the state. Remarkable statement. It's only 3% of Oregon's population. Why can't it be 10%? Why can't it be 20? Why can't it be 25? Who in this room, who is watching, who is listening, can tell me that it can't be 25% of Oregon's population? I believe it can be. I believe we can create a better society of Oregon. And it starts by citizen particip participation. It's not observation. It's not I'll watch. It's what can I do? What turns me on? How can I make my Oregon better? When Governor Tom McCall created Solve, he came up with the most remarkable quote that I absolutely love, and it's indelibly etched into my brain. And the quote is this, heroes are not giant statues framed against a red sky. They are people who say, this is my community, 
and it's my responsibility to make it better. And Solve, along with all of the other wonderful nonprofit organizations in this state, give every single Oregonian the opportunity to put their head on the pillow that night and to be a hero or heroine. Four years ago, I was approached by the Oregonian to write an op-ed piece for a Sunday editorial section. They asked me where did I think Oregon was headed? And this was during the everybody's 401k was nice and fat. We were keeping, trying to keep people out from moving into Oregon, right? I said that I felt that Oregon was losing its compass heading and that shortly we were going to say, what happened to our Oregon and when did it change? It wouldn't happen in a cataclysmic instant like a subduction zone earthquake. Instead, it would be subtle, like sand spilling through your fingers. I then brought up an idea that one way to create a beginning, a central thought for Oregonians, was to bring a cross-section of citizens together and collectively create the Oregon Owner's Manual, a manual for the care and feeding of the Oregon spirit. In returning to the Solve office that Monday morning, we were flooded with telephone calls, letters, and emails from a people across the entire state of Oregon, stating that the tone of the piece was exactly how they felt, and that if a manual was a great idea and if it could, they could help, they'd be willing to help. So after three years of effort by a wonderful Solve staff, we are proud to announce that this book, dedicated to the care and feeding of the Oregon spirit, is now a reality. The manual is a, compi a compilation of essays, best practices, and observations by a diverse group of all Oregonians. It's not my Oregonian. It's not my Oregon uh, manual. It's not your Oregon manual. It's Oregon's owner's manual. It's the people of Oregon talking about how they feel about their state. It's all of Oregon. It's about Oregon, by Oregon, for Oregon. In addition, it contains descriptive overviews of each of Oregon's 36 counties. I guess the best analogy is it's a blue book with passion. <laughs> it is our wish that it finds its way into as many Oregon homes and schools as possible. What a great way to welcome new residents, give meaningful year-end gifts to family members, employees, associates, and clients, or just to make a personal statement about how one feels about their treasured home called Oregon. Enough of the advertisement. That's it. With your permission, I'd like to read just a few of the heartfelt statements from your fellow Oregonians because they're much more eloquent than I could ever be. This one's from Kristen Reese out of Hood River. The beauty of this place is like no other. Overlooking the mighty Columbia River, Mount Hood rises above the fruitful Hood River Valley as our watchful guardian. Wind pushes white caps out of the raging river into fine mist just above the surface. Sun opens the clouds to reveal mountains on their snowy white robes. Trees laden with the fruits of the season blanket the valley and promise new life upon the return of spring. People with a dream for this place, dreams of how it used to be, dreams of what it will become, have found refuge within our human community. Forests and rivers, wildlife and wonder, there is no place I would rather be, and when I am here, I am home. This is from Jay Young from the metropolitan area. It started to rain. I hope so soon. I sat down in a rocking chair next to the stove and looked out at the window at the gray, dark, dank rain. Is this to be my new life, my new home? But the rain was somehow very comforting, and rather than fight it, I had decided to go out in it and embrace the elements. In the next moment, there stretched across the road in which I was standing, a rainbow. I watched in amazement as it painted itself from left to right, arcing directly over my head and completing its course in the field to my right. I was standing in the middle of a rainbow. In that moment, I knew with absolute certainty that I was in the most beautiful place in the world. And as I tell my East Coast friends when they ask me, how do I like living in New Oregon? I say, so what's there not to like? I have learned the Oregon way of understatement. Jim Mundell from Neatarts, our friends down at the Oregon coast in Tillamook County. I know that much remains to be done, but ah, the scenery from my window today has everything on hold. A train of swells 30 feet high is pounding the rocks and shore, creating a foamy chaos, a roar to match any plane, and a trembling of the earth easy to feel. And all of this highlighted by quick bursts of sunlight between racing clouds. An eagle flew north up the bay, landed on the sand spit to investigate a possible tasty morsel, tossed up in the tide, and then flew off again. 
Then a coyote appeared, sniffing through the same piles of storm-tossed debris. These pesky interruptions make getting anything done a joke, and I wouldn't have it any other way. I've got two more for you, folks. How do the folks in Wallowa County feel? Yay, Wallowa County. How do they feel? How do they feel about their Oregon? This is what Wendy Hansen says. After a life of unsettled wandering and traveling, I happened upon this exquisite corner of the earth and was finally home. Words can't express the secure embrace of these Wallowa Mountains, the high prairies, the canyons, and the family of people who make their lives here. How about Susan Roberts, mayor of Enterprise? Oregon, like good music, permeates the soul, lifts the spirit, and swells the heart. Wallowa County holds the whole orchestra. And I'll leave you with one more. This is from Stan Foster on Weston Mountain out in Umatilla County. Oregon is a magical place. From the sagebrush scented plateaus to the hidden emerald treasures in the Blue Mountains, this is a state which takes your breath away. I have been asked many times, where's the most beautiful part of the state? This is a question that can't be answered. For the truth of the matter, it is the place you are in at the moment. This sounds like a cliche, but Oregon is too magnificent to reduce to a single place, person, or thing. I am grateful every day for the chance to see the breeze blow on a wheat field or the clouds flood the sky over the one of our many mountaintops. It shapes our view of ourselves and our faith in the future. The only divide that exists in Oregon is the one between what you've seen and what you will never get to experience. As Oregonians, life is too short. Think about it. We are the luckiest people on the planet. We have before us the eloquence of Lewis Mumford. What do we do with it? These words are from your fellow citizens. What do each of us have to add? So here we are today. What will our children know us for? Apathy and status quo? Polarization? Inflammatory statements? Leaving the problems we face today for the next generation to, to tackle? Or can it be that we take it upon ourselves to actually do something, not leave it to the other guy, not leave it to the other woman, for us actually to do something? Do we have enough intelligence, imagination, and cooperation among us? If so, what a heritage, a legacy, we can leave our children and future generations. Yes, this is a mighty challenge, and our backs to a wall are to a wall, and a big wall it is. But what an opportunity we now have in our hands to create a new Oregon. 50 years from now, we will be remembered for what we now do. Let's all work together to make it a sterling epitaph. Thank you very much. That was terrific, Jack. Thank you so much. On to questions. One benefit of being a club member, of course, is that club members can ask questions of our guests. Our first question today though, will be asked by our board host, Mike Burton. Mike is chair of the uh, club's development committee and has had a career in public service that includes five sessions in the Oregon House of Representatives and two terms as executive director of Metro. And last week, he was named vice provost extended studies at PSU. Uh, following Mike's question, uh, we'll take questions from folks on the floor, but while he's uh, asking his question, please go ahead and line up behind the mic. When your turn comes, please identify yourself as a club member and ask your question in 30 seconds. Thanks. Thank you, Andy. And Jack, uh, let me just offer my personal thanks for all you've done for Oregon. Uh, it's greatly appreciated. And thank you for starting off this series because it, you're always a hard act to follow. And uh, I know that your, uh, your bylaws prohibit you from getting into politics, but I'm going to try to set up a an opportunity for you to say something as in politicians. Uh, let's suppose for a minute that this is not the city club, but sitting out here are the 60 members of the Oregon House, the 30 members of the Oregon Senate, 
And to some extent, uh, that represents, if you think about it, a cross-section of Oregon, because they come from all parts of the, the state, and, and the governor is here as well. And they're going to listen to you, and they're going to do what you say. This is a fantasy, by the way. <laughs> brought that up. But they're here. If you had a chance to, to, to say to them, following on what you've just told us about things like association and, and that sort of thing, what would you tell them to do? The doors are locked. No one's going to the bathroom until you get along. <laughs> Honestly, I, I hold the men and women of our state legislature, late legislature in high regard. This is not a well-paying job, folks. This is still the volunteer legislature. And when you look at the people that make up that legislature, and I'm not talking about their political leanings, you're talking about small merchants, you're talking about farmers, you're talking about business owners, you're talking about lawyers, you're talking about teachers, you're talking about people that are really a cross-section of Oregon, and thank God for that. I think what's happened is that the political stripe has so permeated our legislature that there is no more center ground, that the voices that are trying to create centrism in our state are being drowned out by the oppositional points on either end of the compass. And I think that's the saddest commentary about our state right now. And I fault both sides of the aisle. The governor can only do so much. And I have great admiration for Ted Kulingoski. He is a man that is mightily challenged under extremely difficult times. And for God's sakes, give him space. Let him see what he can do. Because if there was ever a time for comity, was there, if there was ever a time for bridge building that's gonna take a long process, it's gotta start not during the session, it's gotta start after the session. Because during the session is when the fur flies. During the session is when the special interest groups from both sides take center stage. And nothing can really get done. So Mike, what I would say is I would love to see before the next session starts that a mandatory, mandatory meeting be held by the entire legislature, that it would be funded by either private interests or foundations, and that the legislature would be mandatorily committed to going somewhere away from Salem and not talk about politics, not talk about tax base, Talk about everything except what's coming up. Whatever the legislature would be dealing with is foreboding. It can't be talked about. I want to find out about your kids. I want to find about it how, how your wife or husband is doing. How are the crops doing? Did you buy the new pickup? How's your aunt? Gosh, you're fifth generation Oregonian. Oh gosh, you just came here in 1990. Well, welcome to the state. I want to find out about you. You want to find about me. That's what we're missing. Where's the dialogue? So Mike, my long-winded summation, as I normally do, and I apologize for that, is I want to see more people, less politics. Joella Whirlin Club member. A couple years ago, I wrote a letter to you, Jack, and asked you to consider running for a public office. Maybe it says something that I don't remember what the public office was, but um, I'd like you to s tell this audience what your answer to me was then, and um, have you changed your mind? Thanks, Joella. Well, my wife, Jan, and our son, Travis, and I live in a, in a very, very quiet section of Helvetia and we want to stay there. Uh, when when, when the, the hectic life that we lead, uh, we both need solitude and we need real, real quiet times because that's the only way that we can recharge our batteries. Uh, before uh, Governor Kalingoski ran, uh, a number of people met quietly with Jan and me and asked me to consider running for governor. And, and uh, we had a family discussion and it was really going to be that Jan, Travis, and I would have to run for governor. Um, and we decided not to do it. 
And I do that for two reasons. Number one, I don't think I'd be a good governor. And number two, I feel that I can do my work building community through my involvement with Solve uh, in a non-polarizing fashion. Uh, once you're governor, 50% of the electorate don't like you. You gotta, you gotta change that attitude. And my feeling is that Solve is, Solve is doing great work and we can do a lot better work, Joella. So I, I appreciate the question. But that was really the reason, is I really love what I do with Solve. Thanks. Hi, Jack. Heather Komet, City Club member. Um, building on that strength you have in community building, I've, I've got a question for you. I've noticed two dynamics in, in Oregon. Just in the brief time I've been here, I moved here in 95. Uh, and I think that we have a growing diversity in Oregon, mm -hmm. but I think Oregonians also have an increased amount of tolerance for that diversity. And it's interesting because in, in some ways as we become more diverse, I've noticed um, we're not communicating as much, as much about the diversity be for not wanting to be intolerant of it. Mm -hmm. How do we build bridges if we're not talking about what makes us different as we become ever increasingly different? Well, I think that's an important point. You know, it, it's, it's, I guess you, bridge, you, you build bridges in a subtle fashion. Um, I'll, give you, I'll, I'll let you in on a secret just between you and me because nobody else can hear us. You know, it, the concept is when we do the beach cleanups so or we do any kind of solve activity, and we do hundreds and hundreds of projects across every width and, the width and breadth of Oregon every year, we never talk about community building. The, let that happen. The concept that I see, Heather, is really association. And we need more association. We need get people. We need to give people more time to associate. Now you can associate by going to a restaurant, or you can do associate by going to a concert, and that's fine. But I'm talking about association with an agenda. And the association is that you associate and you come away and you say, "Look what we collectively did. We fed the hungry, we clothed the naked, we educated our children, we helped the environment." We beautified a little downtown. And what I see is more cross-pollinization needing to occur. And that is that people from Portland need to get out of Portland. We need to travel in Oregon. You need to go to Lakeview. You need to talk to John, the owner of the general store in Plush in the Warner Valley below Hart Mountain Antelope Refuge. You know, you need to talk to Lita Hunter in Bly between Lakeview and Cave Falls. And I'm not saying it is, that's my mission. I'm just saying get out there and see what Oregon is about and don't stop, don't, don't, don't just drive by. If you're gonna gas up, don't sit in your car. If you're in Paisley, talk to John. See what he's thinking about. I, John, I'm from Beaverton. I, what, what's Paisley like? Well, let me tell you. And then all of a sudden, you've got a friend in Paisley. You know, you've got a friend in the diamond business, you've got a friend in Paisley, <laughs> right? And I think that's what's so important, is this concept of, co of, of, of conversation. We're losing our, 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 uh, the gift of conversing. And I think that's so, so important. The other thing that I would love to see at some point would be an Oregon Sister Cities program. My wife, Jan, was the head of Sister Cities for the city of Portland during the Clark administration. And Jan and I have talked about this numerous times th since then. Wouldn't it be great if Portland had a sister city with Ontario? If Baker City had a sister city with Bandon? If Oregon City had a sister city with Fields or, or, or Lakeview? And what you would literally do is have cultural, financial, and human interaction between the two sister cities where all of a sudden, the branching family from Lakeview sees what it's like in the morning commute in Portland because they're living with somebody off, off Council Crest. And they say, you guys really do have problems, you know? And yet that family from Council Crest comes down and, and lives for a weekend or a week with the ranch, uh, the ranch family out of Lakeview and says, my gosh, you know, wheat prices really are depressed, aren't they? And I think that type of interaction is so important. And that's really what we're talking about. Even though we're diverse, we need those opportunities to converse, and I think that's how we can bridge those things. Thank you. Thank you. Bill Kramer, City Club member. Yes, Bill. Just a question about leadership. In this series, our next session is going to be about leadership. What are your comments about the kind of leadership that Oregon needs to lead us toward the vision that you described?
the vision thing uh, can take many, many different ways of uh, becoming reality. I think the concept is all of us can take part in a, in a separate vision. Some people might be absolutely wedded to K through 12 education, and that's their vision, that's their hot button. Somebody else might be absolutely wedded to uh, the urban-rural divide. That's their hot button. They're going to be working on that. Somebody else might really, really be wedded to, to uh, assisting homeless people. That's their hot button. And it's a shared vision. So the concept, it's not my vision. It's a collective vision, Bill. But that vision has to be sold to people. You know, whether or not you agreed or admired Ronald Reagan, the one thing that Ronald Reagan did was sell the ice to the Eskimos. And I mean that in, in, in a complimentary fashion. He talked about the shining city on the hill, and America believed him. Whether or not the actions prove that, that, that's not for me to even determine. But the concept of selling what that thing can become and having people believe in it and share in that, and Bill, I think that's the, that's the, that's the purpose of, of, of this Keeping Oregon's Promise series is we're going to be able to give people ideas on what that vision should be, but it's like one hand clapping. They've got to share in the vision, and they've got to work collectively towards the vision. I think my vision is volunteerism. My vision is citizen engagement. Every Oregonian has to be involved in something to benefit this state. We are not here to be passengers. We are not here to be armchair quarterbacks, and that's what AM radio is once again. It is this concept, what are you going to do collectively, positively, proactively to build a better Oregon? If you can't, keep your mouth shut. Thank you. Carol Witherell, City Club member. Yes, Carol. Thank you, Jack, for your vision and ideas. Um, when you think about the one or two top environmental issues that we need to come together on, what would those be and how can educators help? Well, first, Solve, Solve has a, a, a very, very strong education program. Um, it's, it's championed by a remarkable staffer, Susan Abravanel, and our staff. And it's really about this whole concept of citizenship for young people. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get to your question, but let me go with the education side first. Uh, Service learning is an incredibly important concept in K through 12 education. It's not community service. You equate that with, I've got to do something. Service learning is, I want to do something. And you equate that with lesson plans that dovetail with service learning using Oregon benchmarks. Solve has been, been uh, viewed by the State Department of Education as the model for service learning in the state of Oregon. And the, its concept of, of the old three R's, reading, writing, and arithmetic, there are two more R's to this equation that we believe in, respect and responsibility. Respect for your fellow Oregonian, respect for the land, responsibility, personal responsibility, and responsibility to your community. There are five R's to education. Solve tries to bring those additional two in. And, and we're working, and, and it's, it's pro providing very great success. The biggest problems we're facing the state right now, whether or not you're on either side of the equation, all you have to look at is the B&B &B complex fire. How it started, I don't know. I'm not going to go there. But all I know is that we have to have the timber side of the equation, the extraction side of the equation, the environmental side of the equation has to start dialogue together. Talk about lack of trust and look at where we are as a result of it. We have to start that center ground, and that center ground on either sides of the equation, those diametrically opposed forces sometimes will never be able to cooperate because that's their only power structure. And what you have to have is that dialogue of common ground. And I still fervently believe, Carol, that that common ground has to come from people associating with one another. If you, we've got to be able to sit down at that table in some Limity or Mill City or Estacada and sit down with that gentleman in cork boots and say, what is going on with you and your family? How do we create a better, better dialogue between the urban and the rural? Because the urban and the rural split is gigantic in this state. Solves address is not downtown Portland. We are in Main Street, Hillsboro. 
And we made that a fundamental choice 13 years ago when Jan and I took over the organization. Nothing against Portland, God bless it. Incredible city, the best in the country. But we cannot be perceived as a downtown Portland nonprofit. So we're Main Street Hillsboro, and we prominently show that. And the reason I say that is because of the environmental div divide, the, the urban-rural split. And so, Carol, every time you can't believe how somebody, when I give them my card, and I'm out in, in, in North Powder, or I'm over in Bly, or down in Plush, and they see my business card, first thing out of their words, I see you're not from downtown Portland. It's a sad commentary, and we've got to work on that. Thanks. Smith Club member, uh, and I'm also a member of the Board of Governors, and Jack, I'm going to ask you to give some advice to City Club. Uh, we pride ourselves on being uh, an opportunity for civic engagement and building bridges in the civic process. Uh, and, and we do that through forums that uh, let us examine all sides of a variety of issues, sponsoring debates, uh, and research that tries to look at all aspects uh, of a question. Yet, some of us fear that City Club nonetheless has become perceived, perhaps for no other reason than the, just the demographics of Portland, as a liberal organization. Um, how can we, uh, as City Club Board of Governors, as members, uh, make it clear to all political stripes that this is a big tent, the tent flaps are wide open, and all viewpoints are, are welcome here? Um, maybe what I could do is use Solves uh, as an example, as an analogy. Um, Years ago, Solve has, has not only a great, great board of directors that works incredibly hard. I mean, I, they're the hardest working people that I know of is our board. We also have something called the Founder Circle. And the Founder Circle is, in, in, in essence, maybe a board of advisors, if you will. It doesn't have set policy for the organization, but it is really a, a, a corporate uh, structure that really is remarkable. 30 people serve on the Founder Circle. John Carter from Melvin Mark Properties is, is with us th uh, this afternoon, uh, serves on the Founders uh, Circle. We have John Emmerich. We have John Gray, the developer of Skamania, Sun River, and Salishan. Peggy Fowler. Six bank presidents of Oregon's largest financial institutions all serve on the, bank, on the, on the Founders Circle. It goes on and on. Years ago, we also had Mark Hemstreet serve on the Founders Circle. And to be honest with you, Solve received a certain degree, and I'm going to be very honest, criticism that how can you have Mr. Hemstreet serving on an organization that is trying to build community? And what I said to them was, how can we not? If we're practicing what we're preaching, if we're talking about Big Tent, if we're talking about dialogue, then let's have people from different views collectively sit around a table, talk about those views, and maybe find some commonality. And I was, I was glad to have Mark on the Founder Circle because Mark had very, very strong, very strident views that he would, would, would come up with sometimes, but he knew that he never could use Solve to further his own political cause. Whether it was right or wrong, he never could use Solve to further it. And I see the same thing for the City Club. The City Club should make outreach to an extraordinarily gr diverse group of people and say, this is our city club. This is your city club. And it not, should not only be Portland City Club. I think City Club, and I congratulate you for this, City Club is taking a, st a stand here, and I know you've done it before, and I hope you continue, of really saying, we need to be players in all of Oregon. We need to really find out what happens in Ontario, or over in Pendleton, or Milton Freewater, or Umapine. And that's important because we're all, we all have a stake at the table. We can't be city-centric. The folks in Umapine or Echo have just as much to win or lose as downtown Portland. Might be in a microcosm, but it's just as much to win or lose. So my challenge to the city club, even though I'm not a member, and I apologize for that, my <laughs> challenge to that. the, I knew it, <laughs> I knew I'm gonna get asked. My, my challenge to the city club is be open try to make it more of a big tent and really not only say we welcome say we want you we need you thank you thank you i think we have time for one short question this is going to be short hi uh mr mcgowan my name is muriel goldman and i'm a member of the city club hi. and one question you didn't ask of how many of us are advocates for children youth and families in all of our communities across the state. And I was in Salem yesterday for that very thing. Mm -hmm. And we talked about some of the very things that you talked about. And I wonder if you would be willing to write another op-ed about 
what has been happening now because it's a lot worse than it was four years ago. And I don't know how many of those representatives, particularly those who are citizen members of the commission, have read it or will even hear it on public radio, or if they even have access to the places that you've mentioned, because they were there from all over, mm -hmm. Wallawa, Umatilla, all the way over. Only no one was there from Clackamas County. I think that's because there was so much smoke coming, yeah. going down by way of Oregon City. So would you be willing to do it again? I, I'd love to talk to you about it. And before, okay. before I leave, I'll afterwards. give you my card and we'll have a conversation. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you, Jack. Clearly, uh, Jack McGowan is doing a yeoman's share in keeping Oregon's promise. We're adjourned. <laughs>